Mm-hmm. Yes, I have. Yes, I have. So, hello, you guys. How are you guys? Hello, happy Sunday, and what happy Easter? Is that is that is that what today is? Happy, happy, happy. Hello. Let me put up my book club announcement and then we are ready to go. Let's see. We are live. Okay, learn how to spell, Kenya. Hello, you guys. Hello. We have a lot to discuss today because at the end of this book club, I need to tell you guys what the next at least two books are going to be. I can't tell you the third one because I forgot the name of the third one and it hasn't come out yet. So can't tell you that one, but I can tell you the next few. Hi, 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 hi. Okay, I'm here. here. Made my announcement. Hello, you guys. Today we are going to be discussing a love song for Ricky Wild by Tia Williams. This is the first Tia Williams book. Let me pull up my notes. This is the first Tia Williams book we have had in the book club because Tia Williams, this is the first book she's put out since Seven Days in June. I read Seven Days in June a couple years ago. I enjoyed it well enough. I think it's one of those books, if I went back and read it, I probably wouldn't like it as much as I enjoyed in the time. I believe in the time I gave it four stars, but I did have some issues with it. My main issue, if you haven't read that book, a character dies in that book. And I felt like that character was in that book just to die. Like you can tell when a character is in a book just to die. We'll get to that in this. Um, and I felt like that was that character in that book was put there just for to move the plot forward. And I saw it from the very jump why they were in it. So that was my main issue with that book. But I like Tia Williams. Tia Williams is so fucking pretty, you guys. I saw, um, first of all, look at the picture on the inside like yes glam queen and then um i saw a picture i mean a video of her signing um someone i follow on twitter's books and i'm just like that is a stunning woman an absolutely stunning woman but let's get into the book because i don't want to keep you guys long i know it is a holiday the fact that you guys are here with me i feel so fortunate thank you guys so much i just rarely does the end of the month fall on the sunday of the end of a Sunday is the end of the month. Rarely does that happen. So I was just like, we have to have book club on the 31st. I'm sorry. I don't want to take this into April when the 31st is right on a Sunday. Anyways, what are your thoughts on the book? I know some people read this book right when it came out. Some of you waited for the book club. Some of you haven't read. But if you have read the book, what are your thoughts on the book? Or if you didn't pick up this book, why were you turned off on picking up this book? What is your thoughts? I will place them on the screen and then we will get on into it because this is first time in a long time I'm coming to a book club with the thoughts that I am having so let's let's play around we have Tia haha haha your twin Tia is say three stars being nice Tia is being strict we have two stars we have 20 pages left but three uh three two DNF couldn't get into it two 2.75 we have a five we have ray likes books gave it this book made me so mad <laughs> we have four stars we have three almost almost a dnf I had a hard time getting into it two stars after four it was so fun four 3.5 we have another five star right here unpopular opinion five out of five stars <laughs> These ratings are spreading out. I'm about to get into that. Four star here, three star here. Think of a three, four. Trying to make sure I got everybody. Unfortunately, two stars showed that one, 3.5. Four stars. I love all things Tia. Um, Four out of five stars. How was that Tia Williams movie that came on Netflix? Was that garbage? Because Tia Williams' book got adapted into a Netflix movie. With what, Gabrielle Union? How was that? I missed that one. I missed that one. Um, then we have DNF. Couldn't get into it. Okay. So 3.5 to 4, 2. 
DNF. Okay, we have a, it was trash. Um, you guys are strict. Here is the thing. I am not surprised that the ratings are spread out because I have been seeing like people doing February wrap ups or this being in a lot of people's reading blogs. A lot of people have gotten their hands on this book. I've seen a lot of you guys on Goodreads reading this book and I've seen across the board. I've seen people give this five stars. There are some people who are on booktube who are saying this is their favorite romance of the year, favorite romance they've read in a long time. You get people who have DNF'd it. I see people giving it two stars. I like This is like all over the board. And for me, I rather have a book that is all over the board than a book that everyone just gives three stars and calls it. I rather read a book where some people have really loved it and some people have really hated it than everybody just think, Okay, either this book just sucks or this book is fine. I don't want to read it's fine books. I want books that have potential. Here is the thing. This email finds you guys confused. I'm confused. I don't know what to rate this book. I have so many notes written down about this book. Here is the thing. At no point did I want to DNF it. So I am not on the DNF train. I agree with somebody who just said y'all being way too strict. Like, I don't think this book is DNF at all. At all, I don't think it's DNF. I think it has too much going on to give DNF. Like I was really, really like intrigued many, many times. So not DNF for me, not DNF for me. Um, but there were times where I was just like, this isn't working. And there was other times where I'm like, whoa, this is kind of working. And so I kept going back and forth the entire time. So this is the first thing. Now, I did finish this book last night and late last night because Beyonce has taken up all my time. And I just really could not sit down and read this book. I was watching March Madness. And y'all know I went to Alabama. So Alabama was playing. So I was trying to read and Alabama was playing. So I just, I kept putting off the book. But finally, I did read it. And after I finished it, I was like, I don't know. You guys know. I'm a very decisive person to a fault. Like, I am very decisive. I know how I feel about stuff. But this is the first time in a long time I've read a book and I'm just like, interesting. This one might have to sit with me. So I want all of you guys' opinions because I am wide open. I'm why I want you to tell me what worked, what you felt didn't work, why you DNF'd it. And let me tell you what this book is vaguely about. This is like the crash course synopsis of what happened in this book. So we are introduced to a character named Ricky Wilde. Her name is Richard Wilde. She is named after her father because her mom and dad thought they were having a boy. She was the last child. All of her siblings are girls. They thought they were having a boy. She was a girl. So they named her after her dad, even though his name is Richard, whatever. Um, She works at a funeral a funeral, what can they call a funeral home? She works at a funeral home in the family. The family has a bunch of money. They live in Buckhead and they're rich, affluent black people in Atlanta. And she's kind of the fuck up of the family. Everyone thinks like she has nothing going for herself because she doesn't. She always got in trouble when she was younger. And so basically everyone thinks that she's like gonna do nothing with her life well one day she decides to tell everybody she wants to start a floral business she wants to start a floral business and they're all looking at her like get a grip no one's gonna buy your flowers well one day she is at the funeral home some woman is coming to bury her husband and the woman is like oh you know i have a brownstone in harlem which by the way a harlem brownstone is my dream thing i want to purchase i want a harlem brownstone so fucking bad Stay on topic. Um, I have a Harlem brownstone and there's a, a lower floor. You can open up your flower shop and you can live there. And so she's just like, yeah, I'm going. So she heads up to Harlem to open her flower shop and live with this lady. And strange things seem to be happening once she gets to Harlem. The story kind of kicks off when she meets this strange man in a garden, in like a garden park thing. He scares the shit out of her. She looks like she scares the shit out of him. And the story starts. We are told at the very beginning of the book that this is like we get a prologue about leap years, that weird things seem to happen on leap years, and that a lot of people don't know if the story of Ricky and Ezra is like a real story, like it's been told through time, and like listen to the story. And that's kind of, you know, 
the cliff note synopsis of what happens. Can't spoil nothing else because it will get well. I'm gonna spoil it, but like let me we will get into the, the spoilers when it's time to get to the spoilers. But that's the cliff notes of what we have going on here. I'm happy. I don't know if this is exactly what you're talking about, Taylor, but I think it is ambitious. I am always going to award ambition, because, especially from an established author, because everyone was waiting for the what was going to come after for Tia Williams after seven days in June. Seven days in June, to me, honestly, put Tia Williams on the map. She already had some success, but seven days in June was that thing where it's like, oh, Tia Williams is here. People are going to look forward to the next book that she puts out. So to come with this book, it is ambitious if nothing else. If nothing, Tia Williams could have phoned this shit in. She could have gave us a melancholy, melodramatic type story and be like, here, y'all go, y'all like it love story and call it a day especially because that's kind of the era we're in in romance when you think how well kennedy ryan is doing how well colleen hoover is doing like giving people a sappy emotional romance is going to get you where you need to be but tia williams tried something and a lot of people aren't trying stuff these days specifically in the romance genre that's why i have grown tired of it because people aren't trying something this book is so damn ambitious this is kind of what I get friends for not reading synopsis. <laughs> I don't read synopsis. It is like, I, I feel like a lot of people who read a lot of books, a lot of us don't read synopsis. I don't know. Like, I don't care. Like if I already like have a feeling, it's, it's something that pulls you to a book. Like you just see it and you're just like, huh, I think I should read you. And you read it. Like, because I never read a synopsis and I'm like, fully convinced or fully turned away. It doesn't do anything for me. So if I already feel like I should read you, like I have no clue what Emily Henry's next book is actually going to be about. But like, I'm here, like whatever. Like it's just a book. It's just a book. If it's good or bad, it's just a book. Um, And so I had no clue what the fuck this book was about. And boy, did it knock my fucking socks off. I had no clue what the hell was going on in this book. You guys, I thought this was going to be a paint by numbers two black people on the cover meet each other in a fucking Harlem juke joint. And that was it. That's literally what I thought was going on. I knew this book took place in New York city because I saw some girl. She, um, was talking about, I told you somebody really liked this book and she was talking about how she loved the New York city vibes. So I was just like, okay, it takes place in New York city. Got that, got that. Didn't have no clue what else was going on. Exactly. Like it takes, cause then you start getting preconceived notions and some synopsis are bad. Like they just don't really tell you what the book is going to be about. You know, I agree with you, Rosie. So my favorite thing about this book to know me is to know I love vintage black literature. I think back in the day you had more of a space to be more creative in black literature. Um, coming off the heyday of like the black literature renaissance and stuff, like with Toni Morrison writing, Alice, Alice Walker writing, you have Octavia writing, you have all of these writers writing and they're writing in this way that is very supernatural, that is very fantasy-esque, if not just fantasy like Octavia. There was more of a draw for people to try to do things that are weird. And that's why you guys know, or maybe you don't, Mama Day by Gloria Naylor is my favorite book of all time. And I love the magic there. And it's just something about when you give me black people and you give me this like unexplained magic, the book just feels like it almost takes place place in a fairy tale oh i love it i love it i love it something about it just feels so like it just feels like pure black literature like everything that black literature was built on and so when we start this book with this prologue and they're talking about how like is this story true no one knows throughout the years i was totally sold i was just like this is what i love like this is this is what i came to see like then i miss that i miss when Black authors used to play with like magic and real and things not having to always make the most sense. Like now we live in such a literal world because so many people are so 
they, they give you no grace. Like everyone is always trying to take your words and spin them all types of ways. So you have to be so literal in books and say exactly what you mean in books. And everything has to be explained in books. Almost every now, nowadays, I feel like when people consume media, they consume media in the light that the person who made the media is trying to trick them. The person who made the thing believes that they're smarter than them. And so they're trying to trick the people who are watching it. So you as the viewer, as the consumer, are always watching stuff, trying to get ahead of the person making it. Like, ha, caught that plot hole, caught this, caught this. And it's just like, you're not actually in dialogue with the creator. You're just trying to one up one another. And people, I think, make stuff in that same vein, too. They make this stuff to try to seem smarter than the reader or the person who's consuming it. And I just love stuff that you're giving the writer, the creator, the benefit of the doubt. Like you're you're letting them fully lean into the story that they want to create. And so I found myself reading this and I was like, let me give Tia Williams some time because a lot of people who are DNFing this book, I just don't think you gave Tia Williams the time that she deserved. I just think everyone is so quick to just be like, oh, you didn't hook me in the first 20 pages, chop. And it's just like, when do we stop being, why, where's the generosity? When do we become so, so ungraceful? <laughs> when do we start lacking grace? When do we stop being generous to the people who we are consuming, to the people whose art we are consuming? Like people are just not generous. They're not giving authors time to really tell a full story it's just quickly like oh this don't make no fucking sense oh this sucks this and it's just like wait a minute can we build out a world can we can we allow an author to build out a world and then once they've done that then we start throwing stones because y'all know i love to throw stones but i just think we have to start consuming media with the mindset that like we're in this together we but we tia williams loves books you love books. I love books. We're all in this together trying to accomplish the same exact thing. Let's be generous. So that's what I had to tell myself at first because I'm just like, okay, I'm fucking confused because this is, I think, the thing. How do we feel about being confused in a novel? How does being confused make us feel? Because this is where we run into my first like issue. I don't like being confused when I read. Um, I just don't. I've read a lot of books recently. So I don't know if any of you guys have read Gideon the Ninth, that series. I like Gideon the Ninth, but there's a book after and another book after. And I am hesitant to pick up the next book because like the point of those books are to confuse you until you get it. And that reading experience of being confused does not suit me. I get uncomfortable. I don't like it. I don't like feeling the catch 22. I don't like that. That's why I don't like, um, I, I it's the same reason why I don't like scary movies. I don't like that feeling of being like knocked upside the head. Like, I don't like that. I'm anticipating something bad is about to happen to me. Like something, everything I think is happening is not happening and something else is happening. I don't like the confusion. I like, I'm just a straight up type bitch. I don't know. So I don't like the confusion. So though I enjoy the magic, I enjoy the magic all the way through this book. I think it's brilliant. I think Tia Williams swung and I think she hit, but I was confused. I was confused and I didn't like the confusion fusion how do we feel exactly 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 it's just like i'm confused like, i don't want to be confused thank you thank and that that is perfect that is exactly how i felt many times like i wasn't getting it <laughs> i felt like i wasn't getting it even when like Everything is being revealed to us. I'm still like, I'm like that Giselle Bryant meme from Real Housewives of Potomac. I get it. I get it. Then I go to confessionals. I don't get it. Like, I don't get it. Because <laughs> you guys, when it was revealed that like she was going to like die, I didn't even get that in the reveal. <laughs> I didn't even get that in the reveal. Like, so when that becomes like the latter half's entire plot point, I said, I missed something. I had to go back. I said, wait, I think I missed something. <laughs> Cause I remember when the thing was revealed, I was kind of like, girl, this kind of none of your business. Like I kind of would have been like, girl, this ain't none of my business. Like, mm, okay, you're immortal. 
sucks to be you. Like, what do you want from me? And so then when she was just like, and I'm going to die, I was just like, no, wait, is, is that what happened? Is that what happened? And that's how I start to feel the entire book. I just like, I start missing things. I start missing things. So things are all coming together for me. And so the stakes begin to be low. That's the thing. There's no stakes for me because I'm already fucking confused. Like, it's just hard for me to invest in something I don't understand. I, I, I didn't get it. I physically read, of course, I, I physically read all the book club books just for this reason. I physically read... Um, did I have anything wrong? Was anything wrong with the prose for me? I did put, I thought the dialogue was cheesy, but that would be my issue with almost every mainstream Black book that gets published. I think a lot of Black books, oh, I could write a whole paper on this. A lot of Black books are performing Blackness instead of actually like writing Blackness. Um, there's nothing insightful in the dialogue Black characters have with one another. Instead, it's just like, social media quips back and forth to one another and when you read the books it's just like there used to be a time where you could pick up a book from 1980s written by a black person and you would get insight on like what life was like in the 1980s how people were talking to one another but nowadays if you pick up a book in the last five six years written by a black person about black people you don't get any more insight than you would get being on Twitter, being on Twitter and being on TikTok. There's no, there's nothing, there, there's no ground level. There's nothing, there's nothing cutting edge about the dialogue. I think in most black books, no one's really telling, like, I want to see how the people of Harlem talking. Like, I want to see like, what, what are people, Ricky is from Atlanta, Atlanta. I live in Atlanta. Atlanta has its own lingo. Have you ever tried to talk to a little kid from Atlanta? Like, have you ever tried to talk to somebody who grew up in Atlanta? People who grew up in Atlanta have such a specific type of like talking. Like you can just tell when you talk to someone who grew up in Atlanta, that they grew up in Atlanta. No different than I'm from Charlotte. I think the same way, same thing for people from Alabama. And that's the stuff I want to see in books. I want to see people really get into the weeds about the language that people use to communicate with each other that just isn't social media quips. That's not just how people talk to one another. In some ways it is, right? We can always discuss how social media plays into our language, but there's a way that people communicate back and forth that's so much sharper, that's so much sharper than the way I think most people write books. It's kind of, it's, it's, yeah, yeah, exactly. Everything is through like this gaze of like, making white people understand how black people talk and i don't want to necessarily put that indictment on to tia williams i just think that's the that's like what's in now that's what's in the way people talk to one another doesn't matter in books anymore people just and this is not just a black thing white people the way white people's back and forth are weird too and i'm just like I, I know white people don't talk to each other like this like there's a and no one wants to have a real conversation about how people are actually communicating with one another these days and so i think a lot is being lost a lot of a lot of history is being lost to this like flattening of everyone's dialogue everyone is saying what's tea everyone's doing this and it's like fun great we could talk about how um queer culture has infiltrated mainstream or how queer culture has always been mainstream right we can discuss that but also we can also have a dialogue of how different ways people talk to one another like when i go to south carolina and visit family like there's a way there's a cadence that people talk in and so if you're going to take a book and put it in certain settings i want to hear those cadence i want to hear how people are talking to one another that's the richness of literature so when i go back like i just read brewster place by gloria naylor you go back and you hear how people used to talk to each other and you get to hear how words have changed form and how things are mean different things now and that's what the books are for right so i did have an issue with the dialogue i say all that to say i did have an issue with the dialogue in this book but it's an issue i have with all black books like all of them like all of them um, except in like literary fiction, at least in literary fiction, some people, some people make an effort to kind of like do research into like actually how people talk to one another. Anyways, let's get into the goddamn book. Here's my main issue with this book. Why this book, I don't think gonna get a four star from me or a five star from me. 
the Harlem Renaissance chapters was good. And then they just left. The Harlem Renaissance chapters was good. And then they just left. In the first note, I said, I said, I don't know about this historical fiction timeline. Okay. Kennedy Ryan, this lady, Kennedy Ryan, she wrote, wrote a book called Real. It was indie published, I believe. It was before she put out Before I Let Go. And I hated certain elements of that book because of the historical timeline. Like I couldn't jive with it. I couldn't, I don't always jive with historical fiction. I'm going to be so honest with you guys. I don't always jive with that. And so I was at first, when we went to the Harlem Renaissance timeline, I was like, oh brother, oh brother. But then once we got there, I was in it. I was in it. I was fully in it. And I was like, this is good. And then they just go away. They just go away and it gets picked back up. Because the thing is, if it was just going away to give us Ezra's backstory, fair enough, fair enough. But it comes back to give us, what is her name? Felicia, Felicity, whatever her name is, the one who put this hex on him. The timeline comes back to tell us how he got the hex put on him. So I don't understand, Tia. Why don't we, why didn't we just weave his story in with Ricky's story and the Harlem Renaissance story? Like we slowly, slowly, slowly get what happened to him instead of him just vomiting out everything that happened to him on the top of that brownstone why not we get the story of what happened that led him to being um that led him to getting a curse put on him and then we would read and be like whoa whoa that's what happened and then we could get the reveal of that old lady being the daughter we could get that reveal somewhere in his timeline Another thing, so while we would be doing that, why wasn't Ezra and Ricky like hanging out? I love a gag. I love a gag in a book. I would have loved if Ricky and Ezra would have met one another, normal, real normal tea. And like Ricky was just acting weird the whole time. Ricky was just acting real weird the whole time. So Ricky is trying to, not Ricky, sorry, Ezra. Ezra's just acting weird the whole time. Ezra's trying to court Ricky all of this stuff, but there's just something that's fucking weird about him. Like something is really weird. Having little tidbits of like him kind of being old, having those kind of just being dropped and like, you're still getting this Harlem Renaissance storyline. So you're kind of connecting the dots. You're like, how the fuck would he end up here though? And like just getting little subtle things back and forth. And then one day he just drops the bomb. Like, girl, let me tell you. And then we get the chapter of her getting, uh, her jumping off the building of the brownstone. And then everything just comes together. Like this book just had so much potential for me. It had so much potential. And I was just like, the pieces are here. The pieces are all here for something that really could have blew my socks off. You guys know, controversially, I love The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue. I love that book. But you have to keep in mind, The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue was clocking out at like, what, 500 pages? The Invisible Life of Addie LaRue is long as shit. And so my biggest complaint with this book is this book could have been longer. This book could have been longer. If we were going to do this, I think we should have leaned in. I think we should have fully leaned into it and just give me two rich stories coming together. And it's just like, boom, boom. Are you gagged? I would have loved it. I agree. It was just vapid a little bit. Like, because it was so ambitious, it just, if you, it's the issue with these types of stories, right? If you're going to be ambitious, if you don't land it, if you half step it, it's just going to look clunky. Y'all know I love the word clunky. And like, I think it just kind of perfectly goes with like, what doesn't work well in this book. Like, it just, it's just a bit clunky. I think more time should have been spent on it yes it's so long and like that's that's exactly why i get why this book couldn't be long right because like addy larue is long <laughs> it's long this is a romance book tia williams writes romance books her audience is romance books she's known for romance books she you just can't all of a sudden just flip flip it and start giving people 500 page books like it just don't work that way like i'm not i'm not obtuse to how publishing works you just can't flip the script like that and do that but it's just like but if we did what when when are we going to start prioritizing the arts if we did it would have been like this could have been like addy larue because i enjoyed all the slow reveals of an addy larue and this could have been the black addy larue but better but better 
Speaking of, another one of my high notes. Thank you, Celine, for giving us this. Ricky is unserious. Y'all know clunky, unserious, unserious, my second favorite word. Ricky is criminally unserious. Ricky is criminally unserious to carry a book like this. Yep. Yep. I'm going to say it. Let's start at the dinner table. The most bizarre scene. Did that grown ass man call his kids bitches? Did that man call his kids bitches? Or did Ricky call her sister bitches? I need to go back and did he call his kids, his, his daughter's bitches? Is that what I read? Is that what I read? Because I said, what? Huh? What's going on here? What is going on here? Um, everything about Ricky's backstory is so unserious. Like, so she comes from this affluent family. She keeps saying she lives in Buckhead. I live in Atlanta. You can live in Buckhead and still be in a fucking hood. Like, please, your car can get jacked up in Buckhead. Like, baby, I wouldn't leave my car overnight in Buckhead. But that's just no Tino shade. <laughs> that's no Tino shade. That's just Atlanta, baby. But, like, and she's just, I'm from this affluent family. And that's so mean to me. It was just so, like, stop. Like, stop, insert rich black family. He did call them bitches. And I said, what? Who who does? This is this is one of those things where I said, like, who talks like this? So I'm supposed to believe this affluent black man who is all into respectability and shit is calling his daughters bitches? Is this is what and, and so that that took me a me. I said, we are dealing with a crop of unserious people. He is at dinner with his children. His daughters leave the table, and to his youngest daughter, he calls them bitches, like cackling bitches or mean bitch. I said, okay, maybe y'all do things differently down in Buckhead, but that's weird. Thank you, Monty. Thank you. They go, so they, they, and then, like, they're, like, rude. I love Atlanta. And the restaurant scene in Atlanta is great. You can, oh, you can eat great in Atlanta. But the sit here and act like it's, like, front and with New York. Like, New York, like, seriously, like, we got great restaurants in Atlanta, too. Shut up. Like, they, they were just so unseen. And, like, I'm just, like, she's starting a flower business. And nothing they're doing is all that great. Nothing that the girls are doing is all that great like everything they're doing is just an extension of a funeral home business if you go from where i'm from i'm from the south south everybody and their mama got a funeral home business willie watkins like jerome and james like everybody everybody got somebody who had a funeral home business like this ain't nothing great this ain't nothing great. Like they're sitting here acting like they're Vanderbilts. Like they literally built the railroads, invented the banks, Morgans, and like y'all have a funeral home business. Fucking relax. And then when she says she wants to start a floral company, she's like, this is gonna flop. This it's not even that big of like an endeavor, and they're rude about it. So her whole backstory completely hated. Completely hated. Couldn't get on board with Ricky because I said she's just this. This isn't this isn't real. This isn't real. The entire time they were vapid and stupid, and so like the issue is when Ricky is going through her issues throughout the entire book. You're like, girl, I kind of don't care. I kind of don't care because like all of this is like kind of silly like you could work at the funeral home and do the flower shop really like really and so i'm just like give me ezra what ezra got going home what ezra got and then how do we feel about ricky just accepting the fact that she was gonna die it added to the unseriousness of her i thought the whole last act of this book was really gonna be about them trying to break the spell because like oh she's gonna die like i don't want to die but she's just like i had fun i had fun let me take a sleeping pill and do some mushrooms and call it a day how does the lady dying of cancer seem to have more of a will to live than you than you it just made it seem like what i already thought ricky didn't like her life either. like ricky's life sucked anyway <laughs> <laughs> Ricky didn't have anything going on. She didn't have anything going on. She spent her days putting flowers outside of historical Harlem sites and taking pictures for Instagram. She had nothing fucking going on anyway. 
So like the stakes were there. I'm just like, okay, okay. W how much will be lost if Ricky is not in the world? <laughs> and it seemed like that's how Ricky felt too. Like what will be lost if Ricky is not in the world? And so here's the, okay. So she starts the stupid flower company. She gets a write up in a New York paper. And that's what convinces her sisters like she's doing something. A write up in a New York paper about a flower shop. That's what the fuck they do in New York City. Like open up any business and get you a write up in a New York shop. Like who cares? Like it just like everything just seems so low stakes everything just seems so low stakes about ricky's life the business and then oh once we figure out what's going on with ezra i feel like the whole front half of the book kind of doesn't matter anymore like it just kind of doesn't matter i wanted to like tuesday i really did want to like tuesday but like what was there to like after a while like she was there she was funny she was funny funny from time to time i enjoyed the scene of her breaking into his house but like that was for nothing really honestly if ezra's gonna just tell us that's the thing like everyone's doing stuff and it all seems to be for nothing um then she breaks into his house which i think is a really funny scene the tuesday her getting a chapter from her pov funny 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 whatever and she comes back with stale tea because ezra just told her everything that was wrong with him like i would much rather Tuesday had been on to Ezra the entire time. And it's just like, no, he's fucking weird. Like, let me tell you, I broke into his house. And um, Ricky's just like, no, 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 it can't be, can't be. I don't know what you're talking about. We're having a great time. We're having a great time. And then boom, everything comes out. And Tuesday's like, I told you, I told you. But like, all of a sudden, Tuesday just fucking hates Ezra's guts. She breaks into his home. She comes with stale tea a day late and a dollar short. And then she still hates him. And it's just like, okay, okay, fair enough. I thought it was weird that the old lady was calling Ricky her granddaughter. I did, I did. I was like, what the fuck is this? Like, what what, what did I miss? That's another thing. Uh, many times in the book, it felt like a matter of like, what the fuck did I miss? Like, what did I miss? Your granddaughter? What did I miss? Did I miss something? Like, when do we jump from there? And that's where one of my biggest question was like, is this a love story? For this to be Lily Reed's book club where we read all things romance, was this a romance? Did, did, did we get Ezra and Ricky falling in love? Is that what we witnessed? I'm asking. I'm asking. Because now we have to see, does the book work at its thesis? At its thesis, was its, was its thesis proven? Is this a love story? I kept asking myself. I'm like, am I reading a romance book? Am I reading a romance book? Even at the moment when they went to that No Bottoms New York restaurant, I thought we were going to get like a whole day, them spending a whole day together and falling in love. But we get like a scene. We get like a scene. Then they go to some like uh, farmer's market or something. And someone's like, you're going to die. Like, y'all gonna die. And it's like, okay. But there's, like, no moments to where they're, like, deeply, deeply in love with each other. And so the whole Jack and Kate dilemma doesn't work because, like, Ricky, why are you killing yourself for this man? I'm gonna be so honest with you. Like, if some man would have told me this, I would have got out of Dodge and been like, bye. Like, bye. Like, there's no, like, they just feel like they like each other. And that's the magical realism thing. Like, I think that's what we're supposed to take it as. Like, the powers that be just have them falling in love with one another. But it's like nothing, nothing, nothing has shown us that they actually love each other. They keep running into each other in the community garden. He looks weirded out. She's just like, I'm going to stalk you. So now there's, they're like reverse stalking each other constantly. And then it's just like, we're in love. We're in love. I look for you every four. If you haven't read this book, I know you're probably like, what the hell is going on in this book? What the hell? Long story short. He's a perennial. Is that what they're called? Perennial. So long story short, he was dating this girl who practiced voodoo. And the girl thought that he was going to marry her. He is a piano player from the 1920s. During the Harlem Renaissance, he's a piano player. And he's dating this girl. And he gave the girl like a bracelet and she was like i thought she was gonna marry me dude and so she's just like fair enough i'm gonna kill myself and you're gonna live forever and the person you fall in love with is gonna die she sacrifices herself for the curse to like take place so she jumps off the building and commits suicide and so for the past 100 and like what four years or something he's been immortal basically been able to just like you know go throughout life Ooh, i give it then i take it away time to give it 
Um, I enjoy the subtle history things. I love the history. I love when it seems like some care was put into a book, like some researching. I love the little history type stuff. I love some of the pop culture history stuff that is put into there. I thought it was fun as we're going back and saying all of the stuff that he created and all of this type of stuff. I thought that was so much fun. I thought that was well done. I thought that was interesting. Um, that was a good element to put into the book. But yeah, so he lives forever. And so basically there's a world of like people who can live forever. I liked him explaining it. I always love in a book when like someone is immortal and they talk about like other people are immortal too. I love that part of the book. It was giving Abby LaRue as well. Once again, if more time was given to it, I could really appreciate some of the stuff that was being done in this book. I just don't feel like there was enough time. So like, and then when you get to the last act, and they're trying to break this curse. They spend two minutes trying to break in. They just like, let's cut our losses. Let's cut our losses. You're gonna live forever, which, okay, it's not that bad of a fate. Is it that bad of a fate? Is it that bad of a fate? I don't know. And that's another thing. Um, In Addie LaRue, not me giving too much to Addie LaRue, like Addie LaRue was not a perfect book by far, but at least in Addie LaRue, when the guy was immortal, it like, or was the girl, I don't even remember at this point. Um, You saw how being immortal was fucking miserable. Like you saw how like this sucks. No one wants to be immortal. Ricky life ain't all that fucking bad. Not Ricky. Ezra life ain't all that fucking bad. Ezra life ain't all that goddamn bad. Like I guess nobody wants to live forever. It's like staying awake forever. Like who wants to be awake all day? So like eventually you want to like be done with this shit. But like. Is his life all that bad? So, like, when it gets to the limo, Ricky, you're going to die. Uh, Ezra, you're going to stay alive forever. Ricky is just getting the real shitty end of the stick. And she's just allowing herself to get that shitty end of the stick for love. For love. And so we go back to another thing I have an issue with on this book. I'm going to give this book 3.5 stars. I don't know why I'm shitting on it so bad. <laughs> another issue I have wrong with this book is that so the grandma character who comes into the story, we once again have a Tia Williams character who was put in a book just to die, just to die. Saw it from a mile away. Saw it from a mile away. I said, this old lady is going to die because of course, as I'm reading the book, I, I'm not dumb. I eventually, I know that he's breezy. Ezra is breezy and it's all the same. I just don't know how he got in this predicament, of course. So I'm like, I'm assuming he's there for a reason. And I'm like the entire book. I'm like, lady, you're going to have to die. Lady, there's some way you're going to have to die for some reason because there's no other reason for you to be in this book. You calling this woman your granddaughter to add stakes, like to make it for a reason. Because if that old lady wasn't sitting here being like, oh, I'm going to be with, uh, I'm going to sacrifice my life for you. We would be sitting here talking about how, why would this old lady sacrifice her life for this lady she just met? A couple months ago so the reason why it's like oh you're my granddaughter is to make it seem like they have a deeper connection than they actually do so like i already clocked that and then when we find out she already had cancer i'm like another reason why she's gonna die so we're gonna be like she's gonna die anyways and it's so like it, it'll it makes you not have to make decisions as a reader you have to make no decision as a reader there's no like morality decision in any of it because she's already gonna die of cancer they're just oh so close and so it's just like sure she can die but i'd rather her just be some lady off the street who gave you a place to live she's still fucking mad that you uh was the reason her daughter jumped off her mama jumped off a building and now you gotta choose if you're gonna kill this again let's have some convictions let's really turn this shit up you know so i was just like you're here just to die think like once i was like okay you're gonna die and then when she starts dating the woman I'm just like, okay, okay. The only thing did I, I never, I wasn't trying hard enough to see how she played into Ezra's story. Um, as in like her being the daughter, never cared that much to even think about it. But I'm like, we know you're going to be dead soon. Exactly, exactly, exactly. I did too. Like, like I said, if she was incorporated in the story more, like, could have loved her. Um, like, like I said, this would be a, a perfect time if we had the Harlem storyline and the current day storyline, because we could have seen her as younger. We could have seen her as the child. And so the, the moment in adulthood with her being old would have a bigger effect on us because like we've seen her as young and it's just like, 
Oh my God, you're the old lady. And so you see her life kind of sucking because her mama was a floozy, if you will. And then you see her now and look at, at everything she's been able to do, you know? All of those things could have could have got back together, you know? We could have, I agree. She could have just been in the story more. I agree. It's the strongest part of the book, in my opinion, because Rick, well, actually, no, I'm lying. As we're part of the book, this is the thing that's keeping this book at a three star, 3.5 star for me. I enjoyed the Harlem Renaissance aspect of this book. I thought it was so well done. I thought it was so well done. I thought Ezra's storyline was so fucking good. And I just wanted like whatever happened between him, like Sonny dying and him being with this girl and her jump i want that whole story i want the whole story i like the stuff about like um oh there's such a good line in this book about the casual cruelty that black people face oh my god my grandma i have a 92 year old grandma and she was literally telling me she literally talks about this all the time how like you know you make like big advancements as black people that people white people have not had to apologize or, or have, have had to reckon with the casual cruelty they inflicted on two Black people. It's always the big cruelty, right? We see the big things. We see the uh, bombing of Oklahoma. You see Jim Crow. You see the KKK. You see the big stuff, but no one talks about the trickle-down effect of the big stuff. In order for the big stuff to happen, there had to be a bunch of little stuff that people just overlooked. And it's the it's the burning down of churches. It's my grandma was talking about how they had to walk to school. The white kids had a bus. The white kids used to throw stuff at them from the bus that they were walking. It's the casual cruelty. Why like white people, ooh, y'all gonna get it? Because like, that's the stuff they haven't reckoned with. And I thought that was such a good line. Ezra had some tidbits. That stuff is so good. And that that's to me is the meat and potatoes of the book. I just think Ricky isn't a... Uh, She's not a strong enough character, a strong enough woman as well, like just as a being to really hold everything else that's going on around it. So when Ricky is in a scene, she just falls short. Ricky fits with that stupid funeral home storyline. That's where Ricky belongs. She doesn't belong with the heaviness of the entire story. So the old lady, even Tuesday, she doesn't belong with that stuff because that stuff's interesting. She belongs in some stupid book where some girl moves to Harlem and starts a flower shop because her rich and sadiddy family don't like her. That's the story that she belongs in. And she doesn't belong in this bigger story that I think is just better and stronger. And I think Ricky just kind of brings down the whole story. And so it's just like, I would have lived for a couple more days if I was the old lady. T. Williams is a great writer. I think T. Williams is a really, really good writer. I think T. Williams, Seven Days in June is ambitious. I think just when you write romance, there's certain trappings that you're always going to fall into. It's no different than I think even someone like Emily Henry could, I think, write if like if they left their genre, they could write strong books. In other genres, Tia Williams is one of them. Tia Williams could write a perfectly great fantasy novel. Tia Williams could write a literary fiction novel. It's just like there's trappings that you kind of have to fall into when you write romance novels. And it almost seems like Tia Williams wants to write something more than just romance, but like where the money and go where the money resides, right? Like, and so that's what Tia Williams writes. And, uh, maybe, and maybe Tia Williams just wants to write the book she wants to goddamn write. But no, Tia Williams is a great writer, a great writer. Like I said, I don't have any real issue with like the prose of the book. I found I found it well written enough. My issues with the prose of the book is the issue I think I have with all books that are written by Black people in this current time and space with a few outliers. But like, no, Tia, I, this book, I don't think it's anything against Tia Williams as a writer. I think it was ambitious, like, like ambition, like, and then things work. This book in someone else's hands is a fucking flop. Like, it's terrible. Like, this book get to me gets over the finish line. To me, this book 100% gets over the finish line. I just think, like, it could be stronger because Tia Williams gave us something that could have been a lot stronger. I agree with you. I, I think T, I'm going to pick up everything that Tia Williams puts out because I just think a lot of people wouldn't write a book like this. 
Totally agree as well. Why is Ricky? Why was Ricky so young? I guess because Breezy is 28 in the Harlem Renaissance chapters, but I would beg you, both of them then should have been aged up. I, I think this book works better with people maybe in their late 30s. Ricky just needed more to do. Ricky just needed more, more stakes. Ricky needed more stakes, you know, a reason to want to live, a reason to want to be in love. You know, I just, it always just felt like Ricky, that's literally what I said in my notes. I said, Ricky seems like she has more after this story. Like this isn't, this doesn't seem like Ricky's end. This seems like Ezra's end. But it seems like Ricky could go on and live so much more life. And this could just be a footnote in the life of Ricky. You know, and that's not how you want to feel about this big, gigantic, epic love story. You know, didn't feel that way. Agreed. And the fact that Tia was even tried to do this, I was just like, oh, this is I could tell once I realized what was going on. I could tell by the page count. I was like, oh, she's about to fall into a trap. There's absolutely no way she's going to be able to do what she wants to do. In this period of time, but I, I still don't think this is DNF worthy. I still think this is a book that you should 100% read. If you DNF this book, because I think this book, knowing what is going on in this book, is even more reason to read it. I don't think it's DNF worthy. I, I think that's being, y'all read worse. Oh my gosh. I hate when I have to come on here and like drag books because there are books like The Fourth Wing and everything else in between that y'all read with no goddamn problem. Like being, being someone who reads books is so interesting. The people who I watch on social media who read books they don't go up for the garbage so like I, I i'm fine like i don't really get into that but when i see the books that are like doing well or the books that this girl i watch she's not even a booktuber i'm getting messy she's not even a booktuber i watch her for her lifestyle content but she posted like eight books that changed her life and the fucking fourth wing was on it and I'm like did it did it give you a will not to live is that how it changed your life like what are you talking about to me and so when I sit up here and I drag a book like this which I am I haven't even read the fourth wing look at me but I am sure it's miles better than the fourth wing and it's just like I'm talking shit about this book but like y'all accept pickle juice every goddamn day and it's like no goddamn problem like please like y'all read cassandra claire books y'all read like no shade a thorn of glass and mountains and fish and all of that shit and it's just like y'all y'all love that shit so like who am i to be strict on anything who who are who's any of us <laughs> to be strict on anything these days when like the shit that sucks it's what people want to read. So, like, who gives a good goddamn? Like, and so, like, I'm sitting I'm like, I'm being hard on Tia Williams. Tia Williams at least trying something. Tia Williams' books are, are at least, like, you can read them. You can read them. You can take something away from them. I respect them. <laughs> I respect them at the very least. So that's why maybe in my next going into what the second quarter of this year, maybe I need to be less strict on like, because like, oh my, because I'm being, I'm being so strict on the books that are fine, that the books that are not fine, that suck. People are so loud about them, about them being great. Maybe those are the books that are getting attention because the people know how to shut up and just let something be. And that's why it gets praised. But if you're being hard on the shit that is fine and it's what people should be reading, I'm just like, huh, huh. It's so funny. I feel that exact same way about thrillers. Have you ever seen someone read a thriller book? It's how I feel about, what's that, Verity by Colleen Hoover? And you can tell the people who enjoy this book have never read a thriller before. So if you've never read a thriller before, Verity is gonna goop and gag you because you're like amazed that books can like do this. Like, whoa, whoa, a plot twist, huh, right? But you wanna tell them like, you can read good books. <laughs> you you wanna shake these people who are so blown away by these books and be like, you know there's good books out there. Like if you just put the TikTok down, you could read some fucking shit that could blow your fucking socks off. Like if you just try, but you can't say that because then you just sound like a fucking hater. You sound like a fucking hater. And I don't want nobody to stop writing books. That's another thing. Did the fourth wing want to put out eight books? Let the fourth wing put out eight books because whatever publisher she is under, her eight books get to finance 
a bunch of books that no one's gonna fucking read. Her being popular financed to so many other people. So like no one who's popular needs to stop making books. Like you're financing a lot of people's careers. Those people who are writing the, the books that people are buying are financing the people who no one's gonna buy their book but the book is amazing. So like no stop writing the shitty books. I'm not saying it. It's just like whoa, whoa, whoa. Exactly. Exactly. I think of this book would actually gag a lot of people. Would actually gag a lot of people. No one. I can't believe I was literally thinking about that because I was trying to figure out what was going to be our book for June. And a book from that same like weird Amazon imprint was like on my options. And I was like, absolutely not. Absolutely not. I don't think this, the single dad's club, we read AI. I put an AI book in our book club. That's what I did. That is AI. That is not a real book. I was literally thinking about that the other day. I was just like, what the fuck did I make these people read? Like, I do not think that was a real book. I genuinely do not. I think that book was fake. I think someone literally made that on the computer. Like, I do not think someone actually would, like, a brain type that out. Don't, do not think it. Do not think it. Do not think it. Fun greater than literature. See, the great thing about books is they both can exist inside one another. We're in this world as well of binaries where people are just like, let people have fun. Do you guys know like literature is fun? Like th there's good books that are really fucking fun. Like there's books that are trash. And like, I read those too. I'm literally about to read the summer it girl, it girl for the summer, whatever. And I've been waiting to read that book for months. It's going to be hot garbage. That's from the same person who wrote, what's the name of them books? Uh, Bad Girl Reputation and Good Girl Complex. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That's my trash. I can admit when I enjoy bullshit, but I do think this idea that something either has to be fun or something has to win a Pulitzer is not necessarily the dichotomy we should be, uh, you know, promoting because it doesn't have to be that way. Like, it doesn't at all. Like, the best books of the year are a lot of fun. Like, there are some sh boring books that people do act like are amazing, but we're kind of out of that era. I feel like that's like a, that's like a sentiment from like 20 years ago, this idea, like the stuff that makes the New York times or the stuff that makes like times best books of the year are like boring. Like you can get some fun shit in there. Like, nah, I don't think, I think this idea that like people who write literary fiction are just, or people who write highbrow fantasy or people who write highbrow science fiction, are just writing just boring fucking books. I that I don't think that's true. I don't I don't think it was ever true, but definitely more so than now, more so now than ever. It's not like they they both exist at the exact same time. Uh, books are fun these days, a lot of fun. Like abysmal, abysmal. But anyways, let's see if Christina Forrest is going to change the weather. Will Christina Forrest change the weather? Who got damn no? Thank you. Let's get into it. That's the real fucking fun. You are going to see some of the most strange. The catch that I freaking just read. If you if you like if you read the catch, what that book was actually about is the most like insane bullshit I've ever seen. Like what interesting the Rachel incident, like insane. Like the, the strangest of things be happening in literary fiction books. And you're just like, huh? What? Like that's what, to me, that's where the fun really is happening over in literary fiction because you can write anything. You can write anything in literary fiction. Anyway, the partner plot by Christina Forrest is going to be our April book. And then we are going to put this could be us for May. And then the something something split, the 2010 split, the something something split is going to be the June book. But we'll talk about that when I make the video for it in a couple of days. But these are going to, so this is going to be next month. And this is going to be the month after. And we got to change the weather somehow. Oh, by the way, I'm giving this book 3.5 stars. I don't think this book is bad. I do not think this book is bad at all. I think y'all are being strict. That's my final thoughts on the book. I think y'all are being strict. I think this is a 3.5 star book. If I reread it, maybe I can give it four. Now that I know Ricky is unserious, I probably could give it four. I think y'all being kind of cruel, kind of being cruel to Tia. Anyway, I will see you guys next month. Peace.